Welcome to Beyond Belief. I'm George Norrie. You know, on this program, we seek the truth. That's what we're looking for. We want answers to questions about all kinds of things, including UFOs, unidentified flying objects. What are they? Where do they come from? Our special guest on Beyond Belief is Nick Pope. Nick used to work for the Ministry of Defense in Great Britain. He had the ability to actually look at UFO files. Nick, welcome to Beyond Belief. Thank you, George. It's great to be on the show. When you were looking at these files, when you were at the Ministry of Defense, what did you see? I mean, my gosh, was it a huge folder? What, what were they? Lots of folders. I mean, literally thousands of them. The British government is in the process of declassifying and releasing some of this material. And it's quite funny because for years they said, oh, this subject is of very little interest. And it turns out that so far over 60,000 documents have been wow. released. So I think that gives you a sense of the scale of it. And this goes back decades. Now, when you were looking at them, you weren't like Edward Snowden, right? You had the capability of peeking at them, doing whatever you did with them? Well, I was, of course, a, an employee of the British government, the Ministry of Defense. So, I mean, I was uh, uh, working on this quite legitimately. I mean, this, this was my, my job, my day-to-day -day business. I investigated the newly reported cases as they came in, but I was uh, able to access the entire back archive of these files. So uh, as long as I didn't um, inadvertently make anything public, that was uh -huh. fine. I had uh, access all area pass, so to speak. Or make copies for yourself, uh, Nick? No, uh, sadly <laughs> not, though I, it was very tempting given some of the material. Uh, but of course now, with the British government themselves declassifying and releasing some of this material, most of it maybe, uh, it's like a blast from the past for me, seeing some of the case files sure. that I worked on, seeing documents that I wrote, which I thought would never see the light of day. Give me your overview on just what you think this entire field is, based on the files, based on where you are today. Big question. I think that it is 99% noise, but 1% signal. Uh huh. I, and I think as to what that 1% is, I'm not one of these people who sits here and says, I've got an ultimate answer right. to the entire mystery. The odd thing, perhaps... And but this it was, is a mystery. It is a genuine mystery. It's, it's not all aircraft lights, weather balloons, um, hoaxes. Uh, the, there is something going on. There is a phenomenon. Could it be extraterrestrial? Absolutely. Could it be something else? Who knows? Uh, I'm one of these people who I'm not afraid to say, I don't know. And that's the irony. People say, but you're in government, you should know. Well, actually, government is, is certainly the British government, sure. which is really, of course, the only one I can talk about with any inside authority. The British government is actually as mystified about some of this as anyone else. Well, we're getting these declassified files now, as you said. And Paul Hellyer, who was the former Canadian defense minister, talks about unidentified flying objects. You, talking about the British files, talk about unidentified flying objects. Here at home in the United States, we're trying to get disclosure as well. And people are frustrated, Nick, because we haven't been able to pierce that shell yet. We haven't been able to get government to come out freely and say, this is what is going on. We know about this. Here are the files. They're not doing that. Be that as it may, Hillary Clinton, of course, during the presidential campaign, people thought that if she had gotten elected, we would have had disclosure. There was an initiative called the Clinton Podesta Disclosure Initiative. You were part of that. You looked into that. What did you find? Well, I met John Podesta in June of 2011. Podesta, of course, had been President Obama's chief of staff. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd chaired the transition team, and he was running Hillary Clinton's uh, presidential campaign. Now, I met him at a private briefing in Washington, D.C., and I gave him an overview of the British government's UFO project. And one thing that he was particularly interested in was the way in which we in the Ministry of Defense had rebranded the phenomenon. We had dropped the phrase UFO and we had replaced it with UAP. 
unidentified aerial phenomena. Now, the reason we did that was that we felt there was too much, uh, I call it pop culture baggage uh -huh. associated From with the term. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, now Podesta was extremely interested in this and clearly, uh, though I lost sight of uh, you know, exactly how this played out, I, I didn't uh, take part in subsequent meetings, but I was very interested to see that when Hillary Clinton started talking about this, which was quite extraordinary in, in and of itself, of course, in, in the presidential campaign, she used the same phrase. And I thought, hey, uh -huh. I did that. You got into I, it. I, yeah. And uh, she, she, I think it was uh, the Jimmy Kimmel show, mm -hmm. and a couple of others, but she actually stopped the interviewer and said, you know, there's a new term for this. Unexplained aerial phenomenon. Unexplained aerial phenomena, yeah, really? Yep, yeah, UAP. That's the latest nomenclature. I so, like the old one. I like UFO. I don't know why. <laughs> well, it, I, I think we can. And uh, as I say, that's what I had briefed to Podesta as being the way to get this subject viewed in a more serious, uh, less kind of uh, nuanced way. People were disappointed that in the debates between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, the issue of these UFOs or UAPs did not come up and they really wanted the candidates to be asked those questions. That was disappointing. It was and it was also quite surprising. Hillary Clinton had talked about this uh, a lot and I was surprised. I thought it was not a, a particularly smart move because I, I thought, you know, to a whole bunch of people out there, this, this might be quite attractive. Oh yes, I'm going to open the UFO files. I'm going to look into Area 51. If there's something out there, I'm going to disclose it. But to a whole other group of the population, I felt this ran the risk of, of portraying her as, as a, a crazy. And, and you know, people would say, hey, look, I'm interested in the jobs situation, the economy, the economy uh, wars, tax, all, yeah, this stuff. All, all that. I'm not interested in little green men. And I actually thought that Donald Trump might raise it unilaterally, even if a question didn't come from the moderator, he might try and portray Hillary Clinton as some kind of nut job for talking about this. Now, in the end, yes, it was surprising and disappointing it that it, it didn't come up. There was a lot of lobbying. I mean, uh, people said, lobby uh, all, all the moderators, tell them what questions you want. And there was a huge viral campaign to get this question asked, but it never it came never up. It never happened. Now that Donald Trump is the president, will we get disclosure, in your opinion? Well, I think, I, I hear people say all the time, oh, this president is going to be the disclosure president. That president's going right. to be the disclosure. And, and we haven't had that happen. Well, it, absolutely not. No, it, since the disclosure movement really first started, and I, I guess you could debate about how far that goes, goes back, back, but sure. we've, we've cycled through a number of presidents, and each time you know, certain people associated with this say, this is the one, and it never happens. I think... As, as I, I think uh, hopefully an impartial observer on this, that if ever there was a president likely to let the cat out of the bag, uh, Donald Trump is the one. I mean, he, he has the advantage of not being a career politician, not being hooked into the system. And I could just imagine that if somebody briefs him and says, Mr. President, here's the file on, on the aliens, he would just come out and he'll go public. He'll tweet it. Uh, he'll tweet it. He'll tweet it. Or he'll be at one Aliens of his rallies. Exist. Yeah, he'll he'll be at one of his rallies, and when he needs to pull out some some big point to to maybe um, you know if if he's dealing with some scandal as inevitably presidents do, to be able to pull this out of the bag and say, by the way, aliens. I mean that's just massive. So if ever there was a president uh, that might do it, this is the one. But will they know? Will these presidents know? I mean, we, we assume John F. Kennedy knew about extraterrestrials. We think Lyndon Johnson might have been told. What about uh, Richard Nixon? We think he might have been told. Reagan, I'm not sure. Carter wanted answers. I'm not sure they told him. I'm not sure they told Bill Clinton. I'm not sure they told the two Bushes. So what about the possibilities that they just won't tell Donald Trump what's going on? 
Well, there are certainly, of course, tensions already between the intelligence community and, and President, President Trump. Yes, yeah. yeah. so uh, it is quite possible that they would take a unilateral decision not to brief him. However, I, I have to say that I, in one sense, I disagree. And I, I know, uh, you, you know, you can list presidents that you think knew and then some that didn't know. My own take is that if if the US government at official level is privy to this, and, and let's not forget the possibility that this has all been taken outside of government and put in the private sector, sector. to make possible, well, makes congressional oversight more difficult, takes it outside the scope of FOI, which, which is a big thing. Right. But let's assume it is in government. I mean, I think in that circumstance, I believe every president would have to be told, and here's why. Uh, the president is the commander in chief. And what if the whole situation suddenly moves from being mysterious or benign mm -hmm. or neutral to serious? To serious? Yes. The president as commander in chief would have to take instant command decisions on what the response could be. And no president could make those decisions if they were having to be briefed from the very bottom upwards. So I think it, it would be incumbent on the, the whole apparatus of state to make sure the president was pre-briefed on this so that he could make those decisions instantly and from an informed position. Sounds like the movie Independence Day, doesn't it? Well, yes, I, I loved that movie and I, I loved the bit, uh, the. Uh, um, you know, the, the surprise on the president's face exactly. when he finds that out. But, but could we really defend ourselves against a hostile extraterrestrial presence? I suspect not. I agree. I, I, I think it's one of these, we can only take an anthropocentric view of this phenomenon, but there are one or two assumptions which I think are so fundamental that they are legitimate. And one of those assumptions is that if they come down here, their technology self-evidently is going Huge, to be orders, orders of magnitude above and beyond anything we've got. And, and you know, you, you could say in human history, uh, what if, uh, we, well, we see the examples all the time, of course, looking back through history, when a less technologically advanced culture meets a more technologically advanced culture, almost inevitably it, it ends badly and certainly there would be no, no possibility in any kind of shooting war. Now you can get into a debate about asymmetrical warfare, but I mean, we wouldn't be dealing in, in a universe 14 billion years old, the statistical chances of our coming across a civilization, say, you know, 100 years ahead of us are vanishingly small far more likely we'll be dealing with civilizations uh, t tens, hundreds oh of thousands, God, yeah. millions of years ahead. And what will their technology look like? Well, as Arthur C. Clarke uh, said, it will be indistinguishable from magic. Our CIA, Nick, has released some UFO files, albeit some of them are blacked out. But that's pretty dramatic, isn't it? Absolutely. 13 million documents, I believe, and a classic example, I suspect, and, and by the way, I haven't, haven't had a chance to read them all yet. No, but, not all of them. No, we knew half of them. Yeah, well, I've skimmed them. <laughs> but, are uh, they fascinating? Uh, they are. It's a mixed bag, as with all government files. There are, there are a lot of kind of little more than um, letters from members of the public and polite kind of three-line sure. responses. The really interesting stuff is more the policy discussions about what the phenomenon is, what the implications are from an intelligence point of view. But you know, 13 million documents, I think it's a classic example of the way that governments handle this. They just dump industrial quantities of this information in the public domain. Good or bad reports, right? Good, they're all in there? They're all in there. And it's a classic case of the best place to hide a book is in a library. No one can possibly go through all that. And so if you just put it right out they, there. They put it out there so it's hidden in plain sight. And what they do, and I've done this myself with, with the British government's program, and even though I'm retired from the Ministry of Defence, I'm still involved in, in acting as a spokesperson sure. for this campaign. Very often, I get to pick the cases 
that I talk about to the media. And uh, the government, of course, wants certain things highlighted and they want certain things de-emphasized. Nick, we are in an amazing time right now. And, and we are in the 70th anniversary of one of the greatest UFO cases in the United States. And that was, of course, Roswell. With the 70th anniversary, people are still talking about this case. Something happened near the town of Roswell, New Mexico. That event, known as the Roswell Incident, has become synonymous with flying saucer crash, alien visitation, government cover-up, or many say a jump to conclusion and gross distortion of the fact. What an amazing case, Nick. Absolutely amazing. So many witnesses. Unfortunately, a lot of them have died by now. But what do you think of that case? Well, there's no dispute that something crashed. That's, that's the uh, incredible thing about this. Um, people that are not familiar say, oh, well, the military would deny that, wouldn't they? But that's the point. They didn't. In, In fact, the beginning, they said it was a down flying saucer, they, right? They, absolutely. It was the military themselves that put out or caused to be put out a press release. And they used the phrase flying disc. They, they said, we have recovered, <laughs> you know, th there had been these so-called flying disc sightings in the U.S. and indeed worldwide. The but Foo Fighters. The, the Foo Fighters, but particularly then Kenneth Arnold's um, sighting of nine, I, I think, uh, disc-shaped Prior craft. to Roswell. A absolutely. And so the military said, well, you know this mystery, all these flying discs, we have got one of them. So we, the US Army, as it was at the time, had recovered one of these, these craft. It was even on the radio, local Roswell radio, from that press release. But then the military recanted. Why? Well, within 24 hours, yes, absolutely, there, there was a 180-degree turn. And the military said, we've made a terrible mistake. It was just a weather balloon. Well, wait a minute. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> the 509th Bomb Group, which was based at Roswell, and it was the intelligence officer there, Jesse Marcel, who was involved in the recovery. The 509th Bomb Group was the only atomic bomb capable squadron anywhere in the world at the time. So it was the elite military unit. These people were the best of the best. And if ever there's a bunch of people less likely to misidentify a weather balloon, which is something they were perfectly familiar with, they were launched all the time Absolutely. in the area, um, it was these people. We both knew the late Jesse Marcel Jr., the son of Jesse Marcel, who carted this and flew this material, these craft, to uh, Wright-Patterson. And he would always tell us that uh, his father told him there was something very unusual here. It was an amazing story. Well, I remember uh, him saying um, that I think he was nine years old at the time, something like that, mm -hmm. and, and with tears in his eyes as he retold the story, he said that his father came back, woke the family up, and said, I won't be able to show, you know, keep this, but I want you to see this because everything that I knew, everything that I believed has changed. Yeah. And he pulls out this, this piece of, it's now kind of called memory metal. Um, you incredibly. crunch it and it goes right back to its form, right? Yes. And uh, the family watched with amazement. And uh, the following day, of course, uh, Jesse Marcel Sr. had to take that back uh, to the military. Now, I think that particularly if there was a crash and there's debris, which, which people, mm -hmm. uh, of course, talk about, I think that someone somewhere still has a piece of this. I mean, I think it's human nature. People like souvenirs. People want to hold on to something, particularly if it, it's a paradigm-shifting, you know, worldview-changing thing. And I've teamed up with the local newspaper, the Roswell Daily Record, uh -huh. and we have a campaign, not aimed at the UFO community, but aimed at the citizens of Roswell. And my idea is this. To get somebody to come forward who may get, be alive. Get someone to come yeah. forward. But even more than that, 
going back to the idea that people like souvenirs and mementos, uh -huh. I've said to people, and I've written um, uh, an editorial, which I was told was the most viewed editorial in the history of the Roswell it, Daily it Record. Was. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, and I said, search your houses. You know, local people, go into your attics. Somebody has something. Yeah, look at the little box of trinkets on the mantelpiece. Go up and open the, the chest of your father or your grandfather's mm -hmm. um, military service um, records. Go through it. And if you find in there a strange piece of metal, give us a call. Have you changed your views on Russell over the years? Well, I think at first I, I was quite skeptical of this, but I come back to the point that there's no smoke without fire, and an awful lot of these witnesses had nothing to gain and arguably a heck right. of a lot to lose. They made no money. It was nothing. No, these people weren't speaking out for money. I don't think any of them um, ever got paid more than a taxi fare to a TV studio or something like that. Right. But of course, the reputational damage that, that sometimes people get from speaking out about this subject where still there's this unfair perception with large parts of the media and the public that these are crazy people. Uh, so these, these witnesses put a lot on the line by telling their stories. What about the uh, mortician who talked about they asked him for small little caskets? I mean, my God, how do you make something like that up? I, it's bizarre. I never met him. I think uh, Glenn Dennis. Glenn wasn't Dennis. It? Yeah, I, I never met him, but I heard that that story. I mean, again, why would you want child-sized coffins? I mean, again, if there's the slightest chance that any of this is true, it it's no good saying, oh, but this is 70 years old. I, I mean, I've changed my mind on this. Yes, I, I was criticized a few years ago because I I said Roswell's dead. I said 70 years on time to move on. Right. I was wrong. Of course I was wrong. Thinking about it now, the point is that length of time doesn't matter. If there is some smoking gun piece of evidence out there, it doesn't matter whether it comes out 70 years or 69. So I, I freely admit that I was wrong to say Roswell was dead. I think it is in many senses almost ground zero for ufology. Can we realistically go back and investigate a 70-year-old case? There are some things we can't do. I, I'm, I accept the point that, like any cop will tell you, if you don't crack a case maybe within the first 48 hours, your chances of doing so decline rapidly. At the same, in the medical community, you'll hear this phrase about the golden hour, I think they, they use. And Generally speaking, with the passage of time, um, memories fail, uh, things, recollections uh, are, are lost, evidence, it, it can't be secured. But I come back to the point that if there is a piece of this memory metal or some other smoking gun piece of evidence, a document, a film, a photograph, uh, whatever it may be, then even though it's difficult to investigate something 70 years on, it's not impossible. I mean, look, historians all the time are uncovering new records, for example, about the First and the Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't say to those historians, oh, the passage of time me makes this a, a pointless pursuit. No, absolutely not. When I was a young boy, Nick, my mother brought home a magazine from Look Magazine that had the story of the Barney and Betty Hill case. John Fuller wrote the book, The Interrupted Journey, but it had to do with this New Hampshire couple that claimed that they were abducted by extraterrestrials. It was an amazing story. I could not put the magazine down. I was just a little kid. I vouched at that, at that moment. I wanted to go into broadcasting to investigate these kinds of stories. I was just fascinated by it. Later on in life, as a 21-year-old radio reporter in Detroit, Michigan, I had the opportunity to interview their psychologist and psychiatrist, Dr. Benjamin Simon. Called him up, and I said, this is George Norrie. I work at WCAR Radio here in Detroit. Can we do this interview? And he said, absolutely, and I recorded it. I can't find the tape, Nick. It's too old. Oh, yeah. It was 1971 when I did the interview with him. But I asked him specifically. I said... 
were they telling you the truth about their abduction case? And we can get into that case in a second with you. And he said, I don't know, but I'll tell you this, they weren't lying. Whatever happened to them, and he hypnotized them both separately, and they both had the same story, which was unusual. He said, whatever happened to them, they believe it to be true. And that was the major story. It's an amazing case. It, it's, yeah, absolutely incredible. I never met Barney, who died, I think, uh, many, many years ago. But I did have the opportunity in the 90s, and I, I think she's now passed too. But they're, I, they're both dead. Yes, but I had the opportunity to meet Betty Hill. And my goodness, what a down-to-earth, but still sort of feisty character. Well, when you met Betty, uh, we've got a clip of her that you've got to see, and then we'll talk more about her. Betty Hill was an amazing person. Absolutely. And at that point, it left the top of the mountain, came out over the highway, and stopped in midair directly in front of us, maybe about 50 feet in the sky. So Barney got out with the binoculars in an attempt to identify the craft. And when he looked up, he saw a circular window with a bright light behind it, and he saw these men standing behind the window looking down at him. And at that point, the craft began to descend, and he became frightened, ran back to the car saying he thought they were trying to capture him. So we got in the car and we went speeding down the highway to avoid capture. And as we're driving along, there's beeping sounds. That sounds like something was hitting the trunk of the car and the car vibrated. And then we drove along for about another 30 miles when Barney turned off onto a side road and here were the group of men he'd seen on the craft standing in the middle of this road, blocking our way. Look at her face, Nick. That woman's not lying. No. Now, you can have a debate about the extent to which her memory might have been Correct. skewed by regression hypnosis, and that's a, a whole other debate. But no, I, I, from that clip and from having met her personally, you know, sat down a, a, in a restaurant with her, spent the whole evening chatting, I have no doubt, like, like you, that she was telling the truth as she perceived it as to she be. perceived it. That's exactly and, what psychiatrist Benjamin Simon said that she was telling the truth based on what she thinks she saw. Because I wanted him, Nick, at that age, uh, as I was interviewing him, I wanted him to tell me they're lying. Or I found out in hypnosis that they're making the story up. But he couldn't say that. No, I mean, that would have been a big story for you. You would have uncovered a, a sort of long-running fraud, but, but you didn't. No. And, and uh, I think uh, it, it's a classic case. I mean, one point about it, which I think is, is often overlooked, people are kind of nervous about talking about it for understandable reasons, sure. but Betty was white, Barney was black. Now, for a, a mixed-race couple to put their heads above the parapet, put themselves into the public eye in 1961 uh, in, yeah. in New that Hampshire. Was, that was unheard of. Yeah, that was not something that it, it, you would want to do. You would not want the attention. I, I think they were putting themselves in, uh, well, a difficult, possibly even dangerous Absolutely. situation. It could have been I a mean, dangerous situation. This was, yeah, very different uh, days. And, and I think that is another reason that to me, why I say these people were not attention seekers. My goodness, they, they, would, be, they would have been well advised, I think, to, to keep quiet, keep their heads down. I used to think, could this have been some kind of military operation in that the people that they saw standing by the road weren't extraterrestrials, but military people? And I keep coming back to, no, something dramatic happened to these people in an era where extraterrestrials abducted humans uh, in, in huge numbers, not just Bar Barney and Betty Hill, that seems to have slowed down, slowed down a little bit now, don't you think? The abductions yes, like that? Yes, it, it does, and, and it's quite interesting to speculate why. Does it, and I, th I think there are three different ideas that come to my mind. Firstly, you, some of the true believers would say, well, um, there was 
a program of some sort that the extraterrestrials were carrying out, mm -hmm. and now that program is reaching its conclusion. Yeah, they've which got is, their results, they're yeah, done. They've got what they needed, which is kind of interesting and a little bit scary and disconcerting uh, itself, because it makes you wonder, well, when that stage finishes, what's coming next? Exactly. Exactly. If if I was a little bit more skeptical, though, I like would David say... David Jacobs. Well, yes, yeah. I think, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and that, that is some deeply scary territory. But if I was being more skeptical, I would say that the three big name abduction researchers um, in the 80s and the 90s were uh, Dave Jacobs, who you've just mentioned, mm -hmm. Bud Hopkins, God and John Mack. Soul. That's right, and he's gone too. And that's my point. I wonder, I wonder, with my skeptical hat on, whether the uh, tragic death of these two figures, of Bud Hopkins and, and um, John Mack, has meant that people don't have really the outlet that, that they used to. They don't have these, these prolific uh, two individuals as spokespeople. So I wonder if people are still having these experiences in the same sorts of numbers, sure. but in the absence of Mac and Hopkins, they don't really have the outlet that they used to. So that's, that's my skeptical theory. I, I think it's slowed down because our vehicles like my radio show, Coast to Coast, I think more people would be calling talking about their abduction cases. I've seen that over the last 14 years, Nick, slow down considerably too. There's another case I want to talk with you about, which was in your old neck of the woods in, uh, in England, of course, Rendlesham Forest. As I started to get up off the ground, uh, uh, what formed was the silhouette of a, a triangular craft that was probably about 20 feet in front of me. I was just totally perplexed by it. As I walked up closer to it, I could feel uh, electricity jumping like on my clothing and skin, hair. It looked like black glass, it was very shiny. But in the, the actual skin of this craft, running through it was uh, different colors. Uh, there would be globs of whatever, blue and orange. I was looking for crew compartments, intake, exhaust. It wasn't aerodynamic. I mean, it had no flaps. It didn't have anything that normal aircraft would have. It's an amazing story, Nick. John Burroughs, former U.S. military officer, he was one of those who was there, who actually went up and touched the craft got sick, I think. What do you think of that story? Well, John Burroughs and Jim Penniston were probably the two that got closest. I think it was uh, uh, Jim who touched the side of the thing. John certainly uh, believes that some health issues that he had were attributable to probably non-ionized radiation. Radiation, um, probably. And, yeah. and, you know, again, skeptics find it easy to dismiss all of this and scoff at it. But a British government document um, called the um, uh, Project Condine Study Report was, it's one of the documents that I mentioned that has been declassified and released. It was an intelligence assessment of the UFO phenomenon, yeah. classified secret UK eyes only. Oh boy. And one of the lines in that study said, it might be postulated that the Rendlesham Forest incident was an example of an occasion where witnesses got too close to a UAP uh, we, mm -hmm. and, and uh, were exposed for longer time periods than normal to the UAP radiation. Aha. Well, John Burroughs had uh, an attorney working on a pro bono basis, uh, working with Jim too. Um, and the, they'd got nowhere with the VA. But then uh, Pat Frasconia, the, the lawyer who had been doing this work, 
went to the VA with this document and said, you denied that uh, my clients were irradiated. Here is a Ministry of Defense intelligence study that might suggest otherwise. Uh -huh. And guess what? They settled instantly. Uh, certainly with John, I think Jim um, uh, has not spoken in public about what his situation is, so I, I don't want to go there. But John, right. with John, they settled in full. What do you think happened there, Nick? Well, they clearly encountered something truly extraordinary. Again. In the forest. In, in the forest, in Rendlesham Forest in December 1980. Some people say extraterrestrial. Others say interdimensional. Some say uh, time travelers from the future. Others say some kind of deep black government or military Secret project. Secret operation, yeah. Um, we don't know. We don't know. What we do know is that even those of us who looked at this and accessed all the files from within the Ministry of Defense found no conventional explanation. So if it was some secret prototype, uh, spy plane or drone, even us with high security clearances in the Ministry of Defense couldn't get access to that explanation, that information, if it was out there, which does suggest maybe it was something else. Dick, one of the most amazing aspects of World War II in the beginning was the Battle of Los Angeles, where they saw some kind of an object up there, shot 2,000 shells against it, heard pinging sounds. It was an amazing story. Anti-aircraft guns went into action against unidentified aircraft in the Los Angeles area shortly after 3 a.m. Pacific War Time this morning. The anti-aircraft guns began barking during a blackout ordered by the 4th Interceptor Command at 2.25 a.m. Concussion of the shells could be felt in downtown Los Angeles, 15 miles away. U.S. Army planes quickly took to the dark skies, but whether they contacted the object has not been announced. Army officials say they will not comment until they receive a full report of the action. Although some watchers say they saw airplanes in the air, semi-official sources say they probably were the U.S. Army's pursuit. Several observers say they saw one or more planes spotlighted by 20 or 30 searchlights. The object moved southward, presumably over Huntington Park at the western edge of Los Angeles, and on southward to about Long Beach on the coast. What a story, Nick. And there was incredible paranoia, people thinking the Japanese were coming here. They had sent balloons that, uh, you know, had little bombs on them. But if this were a blimp, it would have been obliterated by the 2,000 shells that they shot there because some of them did hit the object. What do you think happened there? Well, I can only agree with your assessment. And, uh, of course, that iconic photograph is almost the proof of all this. Yeah. The searchlights had this thing, whatever it was, illuminated. Uh, the, the AAA was going up and, and was hitting this thing. So if, if it had been a blimp, a balloon, or even an aircraft from a Japanese carrier, uh, which is, I think, un unlikely, but uh, it, it would have been, as, as you say, shot down, obliterated. Yeah. But whatever this was, and it's interesting that, again, in that clip, we heard that uh, there were references to aircraft in, in the plural scene. And again, of course, at the time, we didn't really have uh, the language to talk about anything else except uh, aircraft and blimps. But nowadays, or perhaps uh, you know, shortly after that, uh, we, would have, we would have talked about flying saucers or sure. UFOs, and now UAP. But at the time, it was just aircraft and blimps. But, uh, you know, people say uh, often, why don't UFOs land on the White House lawn? Maybe that's the answer, because they know that uh, when they come down, we start shooting at them. Well, I suspect, though, Nick, that in this case, we know something that hasn't been revealed to us yet. They, they, if they sent up craft to find this, they shot at this, something happened. I think they know what it is, but they never told us. Again, I think it would require some smoking gun document to come out of an archive yes. somewhere. And, and that's the great thing about archival research. Sometimes some little piece of, of uh, information comes out that totally changes 
people's uh, attitudes about things. I mean, uh, fairly recently, I was reading uh, that an old essay written by former Prime Minister Winston Churchill came out, which nobody knew about before, in which he was speculating quite openly about the possibility of alien life. He was a believer. Yes, he was. And uh, there's a couple of other later documents which, which I think uh, pretty much uh, make that point. Uh, there's a famous document in which he asks his scientific advisor, uh, you know, what is the truth about flying saucers? Um, hmm. You know, what is going on? Please let me have a, a report. He believed the universe was so vast that the probability was many that we had extraterrestrial life out there. Yes, and Churchill, when, when one looks back now, I, I think uh, Churchill is, is clearly uh, a man who stands you know, with other iconic figures as somebody ahead of his time in many ways in, in terms of his thinking and his worldview. I mean, Churchill knew a thing or he two. Knew. There's one more case I want to talk with you about, Nick, and that had to do with the late police officer, Lonnie Zamora, from Socorro, New Mexico, where he was in his police cruiser and then saw something in the desert which changed his mind forever. On April 24, 1964, an American police officer named Lonnie Zamora spotted a strange object streaked through the sky over a highway outside of Socorro, New Mexico. The object was between half a mile to a mile away, shooting off towards the southwest. It left a trail of bluish-orange flames and made a roaring noise as it passed overhead. Curious as to what it was, Officer Zamora followed the object over a steep hill, catching up with it as it lay rested on the summit. What Zamora saw then has never been adequately explained. I love this case. Me too. It, it, it is, and, and unfortunately, Lonnie has passed on, but he left with us an incredible story, didn't he? He did, and, and um, again, about the only place the skeptics have to go with this is, well, maybe he made it up, maybe it was to try and uh, generate some tourism for the town or whatever, but people that knew Lonnie Zamora, and, and I didn't, but I spoke to... He was a straight shooter. Yeah, absolutely. Respected in his local community and in his local church, and uh, the last person who would have ever uh, told a lie or played some sort of practical joke that brought down people from Washington, which is, of course, what, what happened. I mean, there's, there's been speculation, well, maybe the craft was something associated with the embryonic Apollo Program. Right. I thought, I thought maybe it might have been a LEM lunar module lander with a couple astronauts running around on the outside. But I kind of, you know, pooed that away. Well, I think so, yeah. I, I think uh, when you listen to the story about the acceleration that this object was capable of, plus the fact that if that had been the explanation, now the records would be out. They'd be there. And we'd, we'd know right. because there's nothing secret now about the early days of the Apollo program. I mean, we tested the lunar module in the desert, but it didn't go up and keep going no. like this did. <laughs> so it's an amazing story. There's another one, one more last one. 1997 in Phoenix. So many people, thousands of people, saw what they thought was a huge triangular-shaped object. The first thing that struck me is that they were just in a V-shaped formation. Well, it's at night and guys wouldn't have been flying in a V-shaped formation, in a VIC, we'd call it a VIC. So they, they would be in a VIC, and then all of a sudden I realized, wow, I don't see any navigation lights or anti-collision lights. So now I'm looking at five lights passing overhead silently at a very slow rate, and it also occurred to me that they were flying too slow to stay in the air if it was an aircraft. There are all kinds of stories, Nick, about what might have been up there, but I still think the most compelling is that there was an object maybe about a mile long, huge, that they saw over the skies of Phoenix. I agree, and certainly I've spoken to many witnesses who saw something that night. Uh, some of those people uh, who I've met when I've been to Phoenix, mm -hmm. and I, I've uh, spoken in in Phoenix, I now live in Tucson, so it's an area I'm very so familiar with. Yeah. Yes, and I, I, for the skeptics who say, well, this was flares dropped 
from aircraft that had come from Davis Monthan and Air Force or Chinese Base. Chinese lanterns. Yeah, right? uh, over the Barry Goldwater range and things like that. Well, you know, one of the witnesses was the governor himself, Fife Symington. At the time, yeah, and, exactly. And, you know, if, if ever there was someone less likely to misidentify flares, it would be a former military pilot like, uh, like Fife. Well, you know, he apologized, too. I was on the Larry King show with him, and he admitted he made a mistake because initially when this happened, he had held a news conference and had a person in an alien costume standing next to him, and he made fun of it. Now this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. <laughs> a couple of years later, he kind of changed his tune and said, I don't know what this thing was, but I shouldn't have made fun of it. And to me, that was pretty dramatic for him to basically apologize for what he did. Yes, and I think uh, a lot of people were very bitter at that. Uh, yes, as you say, he got his chief of staff to dress up in a kind of alien suit and said, I've... I can now tell people, this was a press conference, I can now tell people that the culprit behind these UFO sightings has been exposed. And out came the chief of staff dressed as an alien and uh, everyone laughed. <laughs> and, and he said, and I've discussed this with him, he said the reason he did that is he felt he had to do so because his perception as the governor was that the local community was descending into a state of near hysteria right. about this, which again just shows you something about the scale of these sightings. And I tell you, for every witness who's come forward and, and given their story, uh, there are hundreds who haven't. And I've spoken to people who said, Nick, this was so close, I tell you, if I'd thrown a rock up in the air, I would have hit the underside of wow. this thing. Wow. Dick, you have devoted your career to investigating this phenomenon. In your opinion, what are you chasing? Well, we like to label things. I think it's one of the things that we humans do. So we, we kind of get a phenomenon like this and we, we try and pigeonhole it and say extraterrestrial, interdimensional, intertemporal, wh whatever theory we, we favor. I can't help but wonder whether, you know, this is just our own. It's, it's like if you see a shadowy figure at the foot of your bed. Right. If, if you're religious, you might think it was an angel or a manifestation of, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you are a, a paranormal investigator, you might think of it as a ghost. If you are a ufologist, you, you might think you are being abducted. What I'm saying is that we interpret this, this through our, our, the lens of our own cultural um, background and our own belief system. So we pigeonhole all these things, aliens, ghosts, angels, sure. demons. My theory is that these labels are, are just very anthropocentric attempts to categorize and define something that may be totally beyond our comprehension. That could be. When the dust settles, when the files are read, what will we have? Well, I think we will have, it, it's what I uh, talk about as sort of, we, we it, it's a reverse of the normal situation. We'll be able to say what UFOs aren't. In other words, we'll be able to look at all the material in this files and, and we'll say, look, the government itself, governments all around the world, have thrown a huge amount of resources at this and still haven't really, I think, managed to define, well, as I say... At least to us. At least to us. What we might not be able to do from all these files is say, ah, that's the answer. And indeed, there may not be a single neat answer to the whole phenomenon. There may be lots of different things going on. But I think what we will be able to say without any doubt is that this is not misidentifications. This is not hoaxes. This is not delusions. Some of it is, of course. But as I always used to say at the Ministry of Defence, the sceptics have to be right every single day, but the believers only have to be right once. That's right. Nick, thanks for being on Beyond Belief. Thank you. We want answers to this incredible story are we being visited by extraterrestrial life? People like Nick Pope, 
will continue to investigate to get that answer, whatever it may be. I'm George Norrie, and thanks for watching Beyond Belief.